Perhaps some, someone near the top of the room could just yell out outside to tell people are about to start. Be, be helpful. Good. Nice short title. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got all right. Okay. Okay. So our second and final speaker this morning is John Keating from the University of Bristol. You want me to wait? Okay. <laughs> Mike's going to go out and... Oh, he's going to yell? He's going he's to be the yeller. He's got the loud voice. Yeah, I have the microphone, but there's okay. no speaker outside. So. I was trying to buy people ten minutes of break time. I was impressed how well your talk was. It was a great pace. Okay. okay, Mike, can we... Mike, is it okay to... Okay, all right, let the people sit down. We don't want people to, to be so distracted by what you're saying that they fall <laughs> down the steps. Okay, I think that's, that's enough. Yeah, so the, our final talk this morning is by John Keating from the University of Bristol. He'll be speaking on arithmetic statistics and function fields. Okay, well, thank you. It really is a great pleasure to uh, be here celebrating with... Uh, with Peter. Um, the first time I became aware of Peter was when he, uh, when he entered the field of quantum chaos in uh, the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, some of you will be aware of a theory uh, that asserts that there was a great meteoric impact about 66 million years ago on the Earth. And I think Peter's entry in the field of quantum chaos was not completely dissimilar to that. Uh, I'm not suggesting that people before then were dinosaurs, <laughs> but it did change life as we know it. Um, so before that period, the subject of quantum chaos was a very thriving, lively area of theoretical physics. Using the language and methods of theoretical physics, what Peter brought in was uh, he brought a completely different set of beef to the market. Um, so a whole new set of tools, uh, questions, um, he, in his inimitable way, uh, made sure that people were a little more honest about the assumptions they were making. Um, but this wasn't simply an act of enforced honesty. Uh, he also really engaged with people in the community. And I think uh, this was a genuine dialogue. And, uh, uh, and the very great success the field has had since then has been, to a large extent, due to Peter uh, taking it forward, picking out the right questions, and directing people to. Uh, uh, to address those questions. Um, the next time I encountered Peter was probably in a meeting at, uh, in Seattle on the Riemann hypothesis, uh, which Brian Conry uh, organized. And in Brian's inimitably uh, generous and broad-minded way, he'd invited some physicists uh, to that meeting. And I was one of those physicists. Um, and I gave a lecture about uh, some ideas concerning connections between statistics of the Riemann zeros, and random matrix theory. Um, and Peter was, was uh, understandably, but perhaps unnecessarily, skeptical of the ideas being put forward then, uh, and so issued a challenge. Uh, and that challenge was, well, if, you're a, if these techniques really tell us something new, go and look at the moments of the zeta function. Try and explain the properties of the, uh, try and explain the number that emerges from the work of Conry and Gosh for the sixth moment. Um, and I think that was a remarkably prescient uh, and interesting suggestion. And it led to a whole new field being created. And that's a field that has kept me busy for a long time and many others too. Um, and so it's in this area concerning connections between uh, random matrix theory and number theory that I want to uh, talk about some recent results uh, now. And again, as you'll see, these are results very much influenced by uh, the philosophy that was developed by Peter and Nick Katz. So I'm going to talk about arithmetic statistics and function fields. So what do I mean by arithmetic statistics? Well, I mean statistical properties of arithmetic functions of the sort that are familiar uh, in number theory. So these might be the von Mangelt function, which detects the primes and the prime powers, uh, the Möbius function, uh, which detects 
square free numbers and weights them according to the parity of the number of prime divisors. The square frees themselves, which are detected by the square of the Mobius function, uh, are the divisor function, the number of ways you can write an integer as a product of two other integers, and the generalized divisor function, uh, the number of ways you can write an integer as a product of k integers. Uh, and the questions will be about statistical properties and the fluctuations uh, in these functions. So to give an example, one might be interested in summing these functions uh, over a short interval, uh, where n ranges over h, capital H, integers centered at x. And the question would be, as you vary x, how does the sum fluctuate? Uh, and how do those fluctuations depend on the length of the interval h. Similarly, you could sum over different arithmetic progressions and ask if you sum, if you do that, how, how, do, the, how do the fluctuations between arithmetic progressions, how, how, how does one characterize those? Uh, or you can ask for correlations of these arithmetic functions. Now, these are questions with a very long uh, uh, history, uh, one that's, I'm sure, well known to most people in the audience. Um, you'll all be aware of Gauss's letter to Enke about the distribution, the large-scale distribution of the prime numbers, a letter which put down a, a suggestion that eventually became the prime number theorem. And if you look there, Gauss was very careful. So Gauss had done some experiments uh, in about 1792 or 1793, when he was about 15 or 16 years old. Um, and he said that what he did was to compute the number of primes in several kiliads. A kiliad is a range of 1,000 consecutive integers. So Gauss split the integers into blocks of 1,000 and counted how many primes there were in these different kiliads. Uh, and then he averaged the results over all his data. And that's where he was led to understand that there might be a logarithmic uh, decrease in the density of the primes. But he was very careful to say in this letter that he actually recognized there were fluctuations between different kiliads. And so the questions we'll be, I'll be thinking about here are, what is the nature of these fluctuations? How large are the fluctuations? And what's the distribution of their values? Now, I'm going to be thinking mainly about uh, these questions when you phrase them uh, in function fields. And here, we, as I say, very much led by the philosophy that uh, Peter developed with Nick Katz, because here one can say quite a lot more. So the idea will be uh, we have a finite field of Q elements, and we define a ring of polynomials with coefficients uh, in that field. Um, and we'll look at sets of polynomials of degree n, and we'll want to understand analogs of the questions I raised about the arithmetic functions uh, for these polynomials. And as is well known, these polynomials behave like the integers. You have unique factorization in terms of irreducible polynomials, which play the role of the primes. And so one can define arithmetic functions uh, for these polynomials. And that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to explore uh, analogs of various conjectures, theorems in this setting. So just a bit of notation we'll denote by Pn uh, the set of polynomials of degree n, and mn will be the set of monic polynomials of degree n, and the norm of a polynomial will be q, the size of the field, uh, to the degree of the polynomial f. So we'll define arithmetic functions here, and the focus will be on analogs of the questions I, I raised earlier. Uh, so what happens if you uh, average the arithmetic functions over all monic polynomials. And more importantly, or interestingly, what happens if you average over subsets of the monics? For example, over different arithmetic progressions or different intervals. So here, an interval will be a set of polynomials which are close to some given polynomial A, um, and little h here denotes the degree of closeness. So these polynomials will be, you can think of them as a small interval centered on A of size governed by H. And as you vary A, how does the sum of the various arithmetic functions vary 
uh, in, in, in these cases. So to start with an example, I'm going to look at the von Mangold function. Um, and let me first remind you of some things that are known in the number field setting. So first of all, we have the prime number theorem. So the von Mangold function, uh, lambda of n, is, uh, if n is a power of a prime p, it's log p, and otherwise it takes the value 0. So lambda selects the prime powers and weights them essentially by their logarithm, and that undoes the logarithmically decreasing density of the primes. So the average of the von Mangold function over a large range is just 1. If you average the von Mangold function over a range including x integers and let x tend to infinity, uh, you get 1 uh, in, uh, on the average. Um, and this, of course, one proves, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this in the audience, um, one proves by recognizing that the von Mangold function has a generating function, which is the logarithmic derivative of the zeta function. And so the properties of this sum are determined by the singularities of the logarithmic derivative, that is, by the pole of the zeta function, which gives this term, and by the zeros of the zeta function, which give the uh, lower order terms uh, in the asymptotic. Um, so the prime number theorem we have says that the error term is just a bit smaller than x, but of course on the Riemann hypothesis it would be something like square root of x. Now, for the correlation function of the von Mangel function, uh, there's a famous conjecture of Hardy and Littlewood in 1923. Uh, so they said that if you take von Mangold and look at its autocorrelations over some range of length x, uh, the sum is proportional to x. So that is, there is an average, co the, 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 uh, the correlation function defined to be the average here, so dividing both sides by x has a limit as x tends to infinity, which is non-zero, typically. Um, and you get some function of h here, which I won't specify. There's an explicit formula for it. It depends on the prime factorization uh, of the shift h. That's a famous conjecture. There's another conjecture which I'd like to focus on today, which is, uh, concerns the, not the sum of the von Mangold function over large ranges, but the sum over small intervals. And this is a conjecture due to Goldston and Montgomery in 1987, uh, and extended by Montgomery and Sound in 2004, as I'll explain. Um, so here, one takes the von Mangold function and sums it over an interval containing capital H integers centered at x. Since the von Mangold function has mean value 1 on average, you expect this to be about h in size. So you subtract h and then look at the mean square of the of the uh, of the difference with respect to the center point of the interval x. Uh, and the conjecture is that this grows, uh, provided h is less than x, but still grows as x increases, this increases like h, the length of the interval, uh, times log x minus log h. That was the original Goldston montgomery conjecture, uh, but Montgomery and Sound um, introduced an additional a constant term, gamma is the Euler constant. So if the primes were completely uncorrelated, if there were a Poisson sequence, um, this would just be h. So these, the log of x and the log of h appear as a decoration of that, which recognizes that the primes aren't completely uh, randomly distributed. There are correlations, and those correlations are what are described by the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture. Indeed, one way to generate this conjecture, or to motivate it, is from Hardy-Littlewood. So if you take Hardy-Littlewood with a suitably uh, precise error term, uh, you, you can prove uh, this. So if you assume Hardy-Littlewood, you can prove uh, a mean square result for primes in short intervals. And that was the approach that Montgomery and Sound took. So this conjecture is intimately related to the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture. There's a similar conjecture for uh, the von Mangold function averaged um, over arithmetic progressions, and this is due to Hooley. Uh, so he announced this in 1974 in ICM lecture. Um, so if you take the von Mangold function and sum it over some arithmetic progression, A mod Q, uh, subtract off what you expect to get, which is x over the 
number of reduced residue classes, um, take the mean, take the square, and then average with respect to the uh, with respect to a. Um, you, his conjecture is that you get x log q. And again, the logarithmic term there is a declaration of pure randomness uh, amongst the primes. And this conjecture, too, you can relate to the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture. And there's a very nice paper of uh, Dan Goldston and John Friedlander uh, where they um, prove this conjecture subject to the assumption of Hardy-Littlewood with appropriately uh, precise error terms. Uh, they can establish this in the range where q is larger than square root of x and less than x. Uh, but for q less than square root of x, uh, even that machinery didn't suffice. Um, and it, re it remained an open issue as to whether, it still remains an open issue as to what the exact range of validity of this, uh, of the Hooley conjecture is. Now, all these conjectures are related to another interesting conjecture, uh, which is where random matrix theory comes in, and this is the Montgomery <coughs> conjecture. So the idea here is that we're looking not at the statistics of the primes, but of the zeros of the zeta function. Uh, and the idea is that one takes the zeros of the zeta function, uh, one normalizes them so they have unit mean density, so at Tn are the heights of the zeros, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, uh, and we know what we stretch those out by the log of Tn to counterbalance the logarithmically increasing density of the zeros. Um, and we compare that with the corresponding uh, statistic for or distribution for eigenvalues of a unitary matrix A scaled by the size of the matrix N so that they have unit mean spacing. And the conjecture goes back to Montgomery, as I say, is that if you look at pairs of zeros scaled in this way, and you take the limit as you go infinitely high up the critical line, um, then that limit exists and coincides with a matrix integral, an integral over the unitary group UN, of the corresponding statistic for uh, the eigenvalues of the matrix A in the limit as the matrix size tends to infinity. So this conjecture, of course, is, is enormously profound because it, it, if it's true, it hints at a spectral interpretation of the zeros and will be evidence for a spectral interpretation. Now, the Montgomery conjecture is also very powerful because it doesn't just establish a connection with a matrix integral. It <coughs> establishes a connection with an integral that you can compute. So Dyson had already computed the integral over the unitary group on the right-hand side, and it's the famous uh, sine kernel function uh, that uh, one sees now in plots and the numerical evidence in support of the Montgomery conjecture, that is, computing zeros high up at the critical line and comparing with the distribution given by the sine kernel, it, it is really very striking. So this, the, this conjecture is intimately related to those I've already uh, set out for the primes. So in fact, this is, first of all, how Montgomery, uh, Goldston and Montgomery established their conjecture for the um, primes in short intervals. Their, their statement is that formula that they gave for the variance is equivalent to the Montgomery conjecture. So each implies the other. Uh, likewise, um, one, can, one can see immediately this will be connected to Hardy-Littlewood because if you use the explicit formula that connects the zeros of the zeta function to the primes, sums of pairs of zeros will obviously be related to sums of pairs of primes. The diagonal terms in the prime sum, where the two primes are equal, you can evaluate straightforwardly using the prime number theorem. And the off-diagonal terms, which involve looking for solutions of the equation n equals m plus h, where n and m are prime or prime powers. Um, well, if you want to count solutions of an equation like that, that's what the hardy lihwood conjecture gives you. So if you, you can evaluate uh, the pair correlation function of the zeta function using Hardy-Littlewood, and what you get is precisely uh, the Montgomery conjecture. Of course, for certain test functions f, you don't need that, because for certain test functions, one knows that the off-diagonal terms don't contribute. This is a theorem of, in Montgomery's original paper. 
Uh, so for those test functions, um, Montgomery's conjecture is a theorem, and uh, really the conjecture concerns functions uh, outside this class, that is the class where, whose Fourier transform has support in minus one to one. Now, just as an aside, um, so this isn't the main theme of what I want to talk about. I want to emphasize this con these conjectures are not restricted to pairs of primes or pairs of zeros. Um, so the, all this extends to endpoint correlations. And this is a famous paper of uh, Zev Rudnick and Peter Sarnak in 1996, um, a very beautiful paper that's had a very significant impact on the field, because they showed that Montgomery's theorem that is for a very restricted class of test functions. One can prove pair correlation conjecture. Uh, they generalize that to all endpoint correlations. That was a major achievement. But at the same time, there was a paper I wrote with uh, Eugene Bogomolny, uh, which is somewhat different to the um, rudnick sarnak paper. Theirs was beautiful and wonderfully expressed and brilliantly transparent. Um, <laughs> uh, in mitigation, if I can plead mitigation, uh, Eugene and I wrote this before we, I think, consciously met a single analytic number theorist. So it was written very much in the language of, of uh, theoretical physics, which means, well, I'll leave it to your imagination what it means. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, we were able to compute something. Um, and what we computed was uh, the contributions from Hardy Littlewood to all endpoint correlations and found that they indeed match with the, what you'd expect on the basis of random matrix theory. And I mention this because what was the, the, the sort of main idea of this paper was that you have to look not just at sort of equations uh, of the type I introduced, mentioned for the pair correlation, where you have to count solutions of equations like n equals m plus h, where here n and m are products of a given number of prime powers. Um, these are the analogs of the terms that contributed to pair correlation. There are other terms that come in where you have to count solutions of the systems of linear equations, such as these here, where n1 and m1, oh, that's written incorrectly, sorry, there should be n2 and m2, I apologize. Uh, so it's n1 and m1 in the top equation, n2 and m2 in the bottom equation. Um, where those are prime powers or products of prime powers. And these we call type two off diagonal contributions. And I mentioned this in passing. These won't really play much of a role in the rest of the talk, but I will come back and return to them very briefly in an aside. And I think Brian Connery will say something about this subject a little later. Another direction you can go in, which again is where uh, Peter and Zev forged the way, is to think about other L functions. So this isn't special to the Riemann zeta function. Um, their theorem extended to all principal L functions. Um, and so the, the sort of questions that one asks about the von Mangold function extend to its generalizations to other L functions in the Selberg class. So if F is a, an L function in the Selberg class, you can view it as a generating function of some arithmetic function, lambda F, generated by the logarithmic derivative of F. Um, and then it's a natural conjecture to make that the zeros of this L function will satisfy a Montgomery type conjecture, that is, will be random matrix distributed. Um, and so if you take that philosophy, then a function like this, a sum of pairs of zeros, you can evaluate using random matrix theory. And that's what Murti and Pirelli did. And so they conjectured that for all F in the Selberg class, um, this double sum over, pairs of, uh, sum over pairs of zeros will have this asymptotic form uh, in some appropriate range. And from that, um, you can prove an analog, a, a general generalization of the Golston-Montgomery theorem. So such a, an assumption would allow you to prove uh, that if you sum generalized von Mangold functions, that is, von Mangold functions associated with other L functions of the Selberg class, in short intervals, you get a similar sort of formula. You get a term that depends on the length of the range, and then a term, a logarithmic term, which recognizes correlations uh, between, these, uh, between these arithmetic functions. Um, so this is a theorem I proved recently, and I mention this because it's, it, I think it's not complete without, it, without interest. Uh, the proof mimics that of Golston-Montgomery rather closely, so there's no surprises 
in the proof. Um, However, the slight surprise is that for many of these L functions in the Selberg class, one doesn't have a hardy littlewood conjecture. In fact, one would believe that the autocorrelations of lambda f, if you sum lambda f of n, lambda f of n plus h, all the way up to x, that's little o of x. So it's very different to the hardy littlewood type scenario. And I emphasize that in the Riemann case, we have a, quite a del quite a, a, a detailed understanding of this kind of formula coming from Hardy-Littlewood. Here, we understand it from the perspective of the zeros, but understanding it at the level of a Hardy-Littlewood type conjecture seems to me, well, something that I personally don't understand and seems to strike me as quite interesting. Anyway, back to the main theme. Um, I want to now look at these questions for function fields. So there's an analog of the prime number theorem for function fields, and it takes an extremely simple form. It says if you get the von Mangold function associated with uh, a polynomial f, and you average this over all monic polynomials of degree n, well, there are q to the n of these polynomials. And so if the von Mangold function has an average 1, you expect this to be something like q to the n. Well, the interesting fact is it's exactly q to the n. So one has a prime number theorem sort of on the nose with zero, zero error term. And the point is, of course, that if you mimic the usual proof of the prime number theorem, you want to write lambda f in terms of a generating function, which behaves like the Riemann zeta function, uh, then that function has a pole but no zeros. So one only gets a contribution from the pole uh, and one has nothing left to calculate from the zeros. So that might lead you to think that the irreducible polynomials are in some sense too rigid or, too, or aren't sufficiently interesting uh, and that one wouldn't expect interesting fluctuations of the sort that one gets for the primes. But in fact, that's not the case. And if you look at the variance in intervals, this is something I proved a couple of years ago with Zev Rudnick. So if you take the von Mangold function, which selects from the monic polynomials those that are irreducible, essentially, or their powers. And you look at the variance of a sum over some short interval whose size positioned at A and whose size is governed by H. So the number of terms in this sum is Q to the power H plus 1. And you average with respect to the center point A then you can establish, as a theorem, uh, the following uh, limit. So you divide this by q to the h plus 1, and the limit you get is just n minus h minus 2. And the point is, this is the exact analog of the Goldston-Montgomery conjecture. Why? Well, their conjecture, if you remember, was that this variance would be h times the log of x minus the log of h, and then a constant that uh, Montgomery and Sound computed. Here, we're dividing by h, because q to the h plus 1 behaves like h. It's the number of terms in this sum. So we expect to get something that's like the log of x minus the log of h. Well, the log of x, x behaves like q to the n, so its log behaves like n. Capital H behaves like q to the h plus 1, so its log behaves, behaves like little h. So this is exactly the analog of log of x minus log of h, and then there's a constant. So the, one has the exact analog of Goldston-Montgomery. One also has the exact analog of the Hooley conjecture. So if we sum the von Mangold function in arithmetic progressions, f is equal to congruent to a mod q, um, we expect this, this to be the size of the sum. Phi here is the analog of the Euler function. So we compute the difference uh, between the sum and its expectation, square it, and then average with respect to A, the uh, residue class, and compute this variance. Well, this variance can be calculated. I'm going to tell you in a minute how we do the calculations. Uh, and what you get is the precise analog of the Hooley conjecture in that it goes like Q to the N. Well, that's the behave like capital X. And degree of Q, that behaves just like log of Q. So it has precisely the analog of, 
of Hooley. How does one prove this, the, the, these results? Well, I'll just give you the main ideas. Um, the key idea is that if you want to average over all monic polynomials, that's straightforward because the generating function for that is just the zeta function, and that zeta function only has a pole and no zeros. Um, and so one can use the standard, one can mimic the techniques of analytic number theory and compute such an average. But if you want to average over subsets of the monics, which we do, we want to average over short intervals or arithmetic progressions, you can project out oops, using, um, uh, using, uh, using Dirichlet characters. So one introduces characters to project from the sum over all Mn onto some subset of that sum. So this leads to expressions involving the characters, and they twist the zeta function, and one gets L functions appearing. These L functions do have zeros. Uh, they satisfy a Riemann hypothesis, given to us by, uh, by Vey. Um, so one can express the characteristic polynomials of the L functions in terms of unitary matrices. That's just a restatement of the Riemann hypothesis in this setting. And then, and here's the key idea, of course, in the limit as q tends to infinity, which is the limit in which we can establish uh, these theorems, um, there's a machinery, it goes back to Deline, but much developed by uh, Nick Katz and Peter. Um, in the case that we need it, the theorems we have were proved by Nick Katz. These sums over characters equidistribute um, become just matrix integrals. And then the point is that you can recognize the matrix integrals, that is, you can actually evaluate them and that leads to the theorems that I've just stated. Now, we actually believe that the formulae I showed you are true more generally. That is, one be will believe they're true not in the limit as q tends to infinity, but actually for fixed q as n tends to infinity. And that we can't touch. But this other limit, the q tend to infinity limit, um, one can establish using these theorems of, given to us by, by Nick Katz in this case. Hardy Littlewood in this setting has, um, is interesting. So this would al had already been established by, um, in the case of pairs of uh, von Mangold functions, uh, Bender and Pollack, and in the case of n-tuples uh, by Leo Barry Soroka in 2012. Um, and they have a theorem that says that the Hardy Littlewood conjecture is true in this setting, in the limits as one takes Q to infinity, that's the limit that we're, we're dealing with here. Now, their theorem's lovely because it says Hardy Littlewood's true, uh, but it, it sort of is a little imprecise in that it says the Hardy Littlewood, um, this correlation function in the limit as Q tends to infinity just tends to one. So, in this limit as Q tends to infinity, one loses all information about the correlations between the um, the irreducible polynomials, the analogs of the primes. If, this, if the answer were exactly one, uh, this would just say the irreducible polynomials are completely independent of each other. They're not one, of course. There's an error term, and the error term they could establish using the techniques they developed, which are very much more algebraic than those I've been speaking about here. So they involve calculation of a certain Galois group to establish an irreducibility criterion, and then counting solutions of sets of equations subject to that criterion, they can establish an error term which is uh, one on square root of Q. So any correlation information, that is any dependence on the shift K, is contained in this error term, but that's the only information one has coming from those uh, techniques. Uh, and Lior gave a lovely talk on this at a recent meeting in September in Montreal, and that led to a very lively discussion where Peter... Uh, led the way in, uh, in uh, challenging the community to do a little better. Um, one would like to get some k-dependence in here and show there are correlations. Uh, and he pointed out that this is very difficult using the techniques that people had, these people had used. It was very hard to go beyond this leading term, beyond the one on square root q term. So, Peter, here's your first birthday present. Um, what one can establish is the following theorem, which is a theorem for the average of the error term. So you take the error term, which I remind you, 
is something like, well, the best we know is that individually it's one on square root Q in order square, one on square root Q in size. And you sum the error term over shifts K amongst all the monic polynomials of degree little k. So it's a sort of average of the error term. And the surprise is this is extremely small. So this one developed, this one proves, and I, this is something I did with Edva Roditi Gershon, who's here. Um, one uses this, these sort of equidistribution techniques, uh, uh, the res, primarily the results I've, I've already set out, and rearranges those and, and examines the details of that. And you come up with this formula. Sorry? Well, if I, yes, OK. If you want, I'll divide by 1 on q to the k minus 1, and then it becomes an average. It's an exercise for the reader. Um, but you, no, you're quite right. This is a sum, because I want to emphasize this, because this is a sum over quite a large number of terms. It's a sum over something like q to the k terms, where the sum and is order 1 on root q. So by rights, this should be something like q to the k minus a half. The fact is, it's much, much smaller than that. It's something like 1 on q. So there's huge amounts of cancellation here. And that's, of course, why it's very difficult to go uh, beyond the, uh, the estimate one has for individual e. Huge amounts of cancellation, huge fluctuations. But if you average over those fluctuations, you get a, a very small. Okay. You can think of another. Think of another question. It says that you don't have square root cancellation. No, absolutely. There's, there's far more than square root cancellation here. Okay, so that's what the situation for von Mangold. I'm going to tell you now a little bit about Möbius because that's another of Peter's favourite subjects. Um, so here, the prime number theorem is equivalent to the statement that the sum of the Möbius function up to x. I'm back in the number field setting now. Uh, is little o of x if you sum that over some range of capital X integers. Um, and on the Riemann hypothesis, one expects much smaller than this, something like square root of x. There's a conjecture for the autocorrelation of the Möbius function, um, which says basically there are no correlations. Uh, this is a conjecture of Chowler in 1965. And of course, this, this conjecture is an extremely powerful conjecture, and it's related to a very interesting conjecture Peter's been promoting recently concerning the fact that Möbius is uncorrelated with any sequence, uh, any zero entropy sequence. And that his conjecture follows from, from this. Uh, the conjectures for the uh, variance of the Möbius function, if you sum over vari in various ways, various subsets. Uh, so, for example, this is one conjecture you find in the literature. It's due to Good and Church House in 1968. Sum the Möbius function over some short interval. Um, and then take the mean square of that. Uh, and their conjecture is that this should go like h over zeta of 2. The appearance of zeta of 2 is no surprise. That's just because the Möbius function is supported on the square freeze. And this represents the density of the square freeze. Um, and this, this too follows straightforwardly from Chowler. There's a similar conjecture for, uh, you can phrase similar conjectures for something arithmetic progressions, but I won't belabor that point. Um, if you go to function fields, again, you average the Möbius function over all monics of degree n, and provided n is bigger than 2, you get exactly 0. That's because there are no zeros of the zeta function in this case. But if you look at the variance of sums of Möbius in short intervals, this is, again, a calculation I did uh, very recently with Zerv Rudnick, um, you can establish this using equidistribution uh, you write this in terms of a generating function um, uh, and then uh, use the same principles I established earlier. You use characters to project onto the interval. Use equidistribution. You write this in terms of a, a matrix integral. Well, these are the symmetric nth power representations of u, and you're integrating over the unitary group u of dimension n minus h minus 2. This integral is just 1. Very convenient, because this is a, an irreducible representation. So you just get q to the h plus 1 as your answer. Well, q to the h plus 1 is the number of terms in this sum. So this you should think of as h. So this is the exact analog 
of, uh, of the good church house uh, conjecture. In this case, the zeta of 2 doesn't appear, but that's because it goes away in the limit as q tends to infinity. Zeta of 2, if you define it in, any, in, in the natural way, um, uh, tends to 1 in the limit as q tends to infinity. So this is the exact analog of good and church house. So this might seem a little boring now, because I could go through the whole sequence of arithmetic functions and say we get agreement with every conjecture or uh, agreement with every theorem, and that would be uh, comforting, but perhaps not too exciting. Um, but life gets a bit more interesting. Well, you are proving each of them. I'm proving them. Uh, but things get even more interesting. I can prove in even more interesting things for other arithmetic functions. So don't be lulled into a false sense of security too early. Square freeze. The density of square freeze, well known, is, is 1 on zeta of 2. Um, in this case, there's a theorem of Hall, which computes the variance of the square freeze in short intervals, intervals of length h again. And it says that in this case, you get a much smaller answer. So you compute, the, you sum the number of square frees, count the number of square frees in an interval of length h located <coughs> at x. You subtract off the expectation value and you compute the average, and it is an average in this case, of the mean square deviation. And, and Hall proved in this case in 1982 that this is up to some constant, which I won't write out for you explicitly, but it, he gives it explicitly. It grows like square root of h. So that's the answer in this case. Uh, there's a similar uh, theorem proved recently by Nunes for the variance in arithmetic progressions. So again, we, we sum and some arithmetic progression, take the variance, and again, you get square root type behavior with the whole constant decorated by some additional arithmetic factor. So the, these, are, the, these are proved in the case of, of square freeze. So what do we get in the function field case? Well, we have a density which is exactly as you would expect. Uh, it's 1 on zeta of 2, but zeta here is the function field zeta function. What about the variance? So if we compute the variance in short intervals, so we're summing von Mangdahl squared over some short interval and then taking the variance with respect to the position of the interval, again, you can write that in terms of uh, matrix integrals. But here the surprise is that, first of all, the answer depends on the parity of h. h is the determines the size of the interval. The size this interval contains q to the h plus 1 terms. And the answer, surprisingly, depends on whether h is even or odd. Well, that's not like the number field case. And the answer is different to the number field case, slightly. So when h is even, the variance grows like square root of h. That's good. Uh, but divided by root q. That's different to the... Uh, number field setting. Again, this matrix integral turns out to be 1. When h is odd, again, you get something you get in terms of matrix integrals, which both evaluate to 1. You get the square root of h, but now it's divided by q. So in both cases, the answer is smaller than you would expect if you were to make a naive guess based on the number field setting. Um, and, both but, but, and the two cases are different to each other. So that, this suggests that there's sort of, one has to be careful making conjectures in these function field settings because the answers can be more subtle than in the number field setting. Now, we were sufficiently surprised about this to go through Hull's uh, theorem uh, and basically transcribe it into <coughs> this language. And you can prove that uh, a sort of uniform theorem, if you like, that uh, this variance for in the short intervals is a square root h, that's what we expect, times some uniform, fu some function which if q is fixed and n tends to infinity is a constant, good. Uh, but if n is fixed and q tends to infinity, uh, it isn't a constant. It differs in the two cases. It goes like either 1 over square root q or 1 over q. So this suggests that there's something interesting going on here because the sort of mantra or expectation has been that the 
n to infinity limit with q fixed should be the same as the q to infinity limit with n fixed. And we've all been hoping for that all along. And in many cases, I'm pretty sure that's true. Uh, but in this case, it is not true. And so there's pause for thought. And there's a similar um, results that one gets for arithmetic progressions. Again, in arithmetic progressions, the result splits into two separate cases, both of which are different to the number field formulae. So now let me move on to the divisor function because um, there's a lot of interest in this at the moment uh, for reasons that will become clear a little later. Um, so the divisor function I've already defined. The generalized divisor function counts the number of ways you can write uh, n as a product of integers, uh, k integers. Uh, so the usual divisor function is d2. Uh, number of ways you can write n as a product of two integers. And it's a classic problem going back to Dirichlet to, to determine the size of the, uh, to determine the average of this, uh, of the divisor function. So in the case of D2, that was the case Dirichlet looked at, um, you sum the divisor function up to x, and you can establish that this grows asymptotic like x times a linear function of log x. Um, and one wants to understand the, the difference between this sum and its leading order asymptotic. This is the size of the error term. And we would like to understand not just its size, but how that difference fluctuates. And for the higher divisor functions, um, the analog of this is that one looks at the difference between delta k, the sum of dk up to x, and a polynomial in log x of degree k minus 1. So that's what we want to understand. So and we want to understand this in this slightly more constrained situation where one sums over short intervals. So we want to sum over intervals of length capital H, as before. So that in this case, as a theorem, um, uh, a number of people have contributed to this, and I'm pulling together their results to give uh, a formula stated here. Um, says that if H uh, is somewhere between, it grows as X tends to infinity, but it's less than square root of X, uh, then the mean square size of delta 2 um, is h, so the length of the interval, times a certain polynomial, a cubic polynomial, in the variable log x minus twice log h. That's their formula. They don't, as far as I can tell, give a precise uh, expression for this polynomial. They establish it is. This polynomial exists as a positive leading term, uh, but they don't give any formula for, for what the cubic polynomial is. For the higher divisor functions, much less is known. I don't think anything like this is known. Uh, there are some upper bounds, uh, but no asymptotic formulae of this nature. Situation is pretty similar in, in arithmetic progressions. Again, a number of people have contributed to this, and if you pull their formulae together, there's an asymptotic. If you look at the variance of the divisor function over different arithmetic progressions, that grows like x over q, q is the modulus, uh, and there's a cubic polynomial in the variable log of q squared over x. And again, what they can establish is this, this cubic polynomial exists with a positive leading coefficient, but they don't give a formula for what that polynomial is. So these polynomials are presumably quite complicated. And again, for the higher divisor functions, much less is known. There's no analogs of these formulae that are known. Well, in the function field case, we can, we can do a little more. And this is a situation where one can do calculations where no analog exists in the number field situation. So one can prove theorems where this is really virgin territory uh, and where these results, as is often the case in one applies, when one applies random matrix theory, lead to new conjectures on the number field side. So that's the goal here. So in function fields, uh, if we sum the... the generalized divisor function dk over short intervals and then average over all monics, um, there's an explicit expression for that. And it is a polynomial in the variable n of degree k minus 1. So that exactly matches what one finds in the number field setting. So as before, we take the difference between the sum uh, now unaveraged and the expectation value and we want to compute the 
variance of this difference. That's our goal. And we're going to express that in terms of a certain matrix integral. So before I tell you what the answer is, I have to tell you what the matrix integral is that appears. And it's this integral here. So it's this function i of k. So what appears here is, so lambda uh, j is not now the von Mangold function. I apologize, but this is the sort of standard notation. This is the exterior j power representation uh, of u. And what one gets is an integral over the unitary group un. This is what, a definition of this integral. Uh, one has a sum of various powers appearing here, uh, limited by n, the size of the matrix, and wants to compute the modulus square of that uh, sum averaged over the unitary group, uniformly with respect to Haar measure. Well, this integral is very interesting, and it's not, the nice thing about it is, it's not one. The integrals I've shown you so far have been perhaps a little unexciting. Uh, this one has, uh, is a bit more fun. Uh, so this integral is zero if the argument m is greater than the index k multiplied by n, follows straightforwardly. It's non-zero uh, for m less than kn, and it satisfies a certain functional equation, which is not difficult to prove, and you can evaluate it, uh, and it's a certain, in a certain range, m up to capital N. We're actually interested in it up to m all the way up to kn, that's where it's non-zero, um, but you can evaluate it in up to n, um, and it's just this binomial <laughs> coefficient. And there are several ways to prove this. There's a, a nice way that uses a very beautiful result of, uh, of, of uh, Diaconis and Gambit, which allows you to evaluate this integral in this first range uh, in terms of a count, a count of magic squares, it's a combinatorial argument that's extremely attractive. And if you count these magic squares appropriately, uh, this, is, this is the answer you get. But there are other ways to, to derive this, this formula to you using the sort of I, results or methods that Gambit developed with, uh, with Dan Bump. So using Schur functions, et cetera. There are many ways to evaluate this in this first range. The harder thing is to go outside this range. And we don't have an explicit evaluation for every range. We can show. This function i is piecewise polynomial, but we can't evaluate it in closed form in the other ranges. Anyway, the theorem we have, we have two. One is that the, if you sum the generalized difference, so this remember is the delta k is the difference between the sum of the, the, divide, the generalized divisor function in some short interval, difference between that and its expectation value, so we're computing the variance of the divisor function the generalized divisor function in short intervals. And we can do this for any k. So we have a theorem which says that this variance is just h, the length of the range, times the integral I showed you earlier um, for these specific values of the arguments. And if k is 2, which is the classical case, um, then one can use this evaluation and the functional equation to give a complete characterization of the answer, it's just this cubic polynomial in the variable n minus 2h, which is exactly what you'd expect, because this is just log x minus log h, twice log h. Um, but here what you see is that this polynomial you can get explicitly, and it's very simple. It's a binomial coefficient. Likewise, for sums in arithmetic progressions, again, these reduce simply to an evaluation of the integral uh, I showed you, and that for k equals 2, um, then it's just a cubic polynomial, which again is just a binomial coefficient. So this gives you the polynomial, at least in this, in this limit, the q tends to infinity limit, and it says this polynomial is actually something simple that one recognizes, and perhaps gives hope that there's some more structure to these polynomials than one might have expected based on simply the proof that they exist, that there's some more structure underlying all of this. And that's often the case with random matrix theory. It points to new connections and structures between the answers that one might not have guessed otherwise. And one can evaluate this. Uh, one can relate this integral to various counting problems. So there are various combinatorial or counting uh, interpretations of this integral, which are very attractive. I mentioned the one due to um, 
Diaconus and Gambit, in terms of counting magic squares. Well, there's another one that follows from uh, theory of sure functions. I won't go through the details because time's pressing on me. Uh, but you can sh- this integral that appears that describes the variance of the generalized divisor function simply is a, a lattice counting problem subject to certain constraints on the lattice points. And that gives it a certain attractive feel. It suggests that these divisor problems may be related to a more general class of counting problems, um, and perhaps that's worth exploring. And perhaps I'll leave that theorem because time's moving on for me. I'll simply finish by talking about the additive divisor problem. So this is the autocorrelation of the divisor function. And here there are famous results of Ingham and Esterman. says that this, for, for D2, uh, this... this Autocorrelation function is a polynomial of uh, degree 2 in the variable log x and with coefficients that depend on h. Uh, more generally, it's conjectured that there's a, for dk, there's a polynomial of degree 2k minus 1. And this is very important because it, this, this, the autocorrelations uh, are used, are central to our understanding of the moments of the zeta function. <clears throat> so the generating function for dk is the kth power of the Riemann zeta function. So if you want to compute moments of the Riemann zeta function, you need to understand its, its coefficients, the coefficients of the kth power, and those are just dk. So you need to understand how they're correlated. And there's a long history here. So using co- basically correlation information such as this and conjectures such as this, there's a long history. Heath Brown computed the fourth moment. Golston and Gonick uh, uh, showed how to, how to calculate uh, terms like this, sums like this. Uh, Conry and Gosch um, used this kind of machinery to make conjecture for the sixth moment of the zeta function. Conry and Gonick used this machinery to make conjectures for the eighth moment. And there it stops. Because if you continue with this machinery, if you continue to simply apply this sort of conjecture and put it in to evaluate the moments, what you find is the 10th moment you get is negative, and it's a positive quantity, so you're pretty disappointed. That's a category one error, I would say. (laughs) Um, And that continues. So all the higher moments turn out to be given, uh, turn out to be negative. Um, So they're not just given by this kind of correlation. And this kind of correlation, which, as I say, has been studied for many years, we now believe is only part of the story, and I'm here advertising Brian Conry's talk because he'll tell you a little more about that. But basically, the story goes back to the story I told you about the endpoint correlations of the zeros. There are two kinds of contribution. There's type 1 and type 2. turns out you need the type 2 contributions, and if you include those, well, you'll hear the story from Brian. <coughs> What can we say in the function field case? Well, there's a very nice theorem of, of, uh, of Andrade, Barry Soroka, and Rudnick recently, which computed the autocorrelation of the generalized divisor function. Uh, and it turns out to have a simple form. However, this form is, just as for Hardy Littlewood, independent of the shift h. Says the divisor functions in the limit as q tends to infinity become uncorrelated. So that's disappointing. We're missing all the correlations in this kind of theorem, beautiful though it is. Uh, And they're all contained in the error term, which again is one of these things that's 1 over square root q. And recently, um, we explored this again with Edvard Roditi Gershon, where we showed that a similar kind of thing, that where one sums over the uh, error term, um, there's a simple formula for that, again, exhibiting vast amounts of cancellation. Um, there's an explicit formula for that sum. Um, so on average, one can calculate the error. There's a formula for it. Um, and this demonstrates this why the problem is so difficult, because each of these terms is 1 on square root of k, and there are very we, we, q, and we're summing over many of them, and the answer turns out to be just a constant. So this huge amount of cancellation will be very hard to capture by other methods, I expect. Um, so that's... What I wanted to say, other than um, to thank Peter, because uh, he, he has given me certainly some problems that have kept me busy and off the streets uh, for some time. And uh, he took me from uh, this community of the, the wild west of theoretical physics. And I'm not sure he's house trained to me, but 
at least he's taught me to behave a little better. So, Peter, many happy returns. Are there any questions? Sorry? Is your dean office out of street? Is my... Are you still a dean? Are you... Are is you still a dean? No, I'm not a dean any longer. I'm, I'm ex-dean. So you're post out dean. of I'm in the post-dean phase, yes. That was an easy question to answer. <laughs> Question up there, by the way. Um, okay. All right, guys. Microphone for you. So it's sort of not well formed, but so you have the arithmetic functions, and you're looking at them in the number field case and the function field case, and you're looking at a sort of dictionary. And in some function field cases, there there are two sort of things happening. One, it sort of confirms what happens in a number field case, and then in the second scenario, it doesn't. And so my question is sort of what are the types of data that alert you to where, which direction you're going in? Uh, that's an extremely good question, and I don't have any kind of answer, good or bad, to it. Um, we were surprised by the answer we got, and even in retrospect, even though we've checked it in several ways, and we, we can see that we can reproduce that answer using the kind of standard techniques, uh, the, the number field techniques, um, I'd say... Maybe Zev will correct me if I'm wrong. We don't have a general philosophy about when you would expect to see this sort of discrepancy. Um, so we didn't expect it. We were very surprised by it. And I'd say we still, we, we still understand it. In the, in the words of Einstein, we're convicted but not convinced. Uh, other questions? Um, so throughout, you were asking questions about uh, the mean square of the average of mm -hmm. uh, some arithmetic function over a short interval. Um, do you have any results for higher moments or anything like that? No, we don't. And, uh, and the reason is that um, the sort of error terms that one gets in these equidistribution theorems that Nick, the black box, produces for us... Um, uh, are not sufficiently accurate to allow us to compute the higher moments. Uh, in many cases, there are conjectures, uh, and in many cases, but not all, one might expect some sort of Gaussian limit distribution, um, but we're not able to establish that. Okay. Uh, one more? So for which families? The, the, these lie in, this impl in a symplectic family, and one ends up with integrals over, over the unitary group. I mean, but which actual families of sheep? Oh, I see. Uh, well, ask, ask the black boxer. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Nick, Nick's probably best qualified to, to uh, talk to you about sheep. I've, not, I've come so far from theoretical physics, I've not gone that far. Uh, so the families, uh, some cases, uh, the family of all Dirichlet characters to a fixed modulus when you take the limit of finite field, that's, that's a family. And then the, this is to, do, to handle arithmetic progressions. To handle short intervals, it's a very strange thing. You look at family of even Dirichlet characters modulo x to the n over q elements. And that's a, that's a more conventional family that, that uh, you can parameterize by an algebraic variety. The, the other one is uh, more exotic. I think Nick likes it more. OK. Um, don't see any. Ah, Philippe. So this q to the minus 1 half, is it a consequence of uh, Sort of long while. Yes. Yeah, so you yeah. freeze all but one variable and. Uh, but that's uh, so, uh, the first theorem, right? Like that. Yes. So, uh, that's right, yeah. yeah that, that was really my question was right. when you're just using long while, you may right. be lucky in some situation where some cohomology groups may vanish and you right. might do better. But I guess you're pointing that you probably should be able to do better. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
Inflation in some cases. Yes, it, yeah. In some cases, yeah. you get a bigger remainder term than than you would get if you had squared cancellation. Uh, this, yeah. mm -hmm. this is what this yeah. some yeah. uh, shows. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> so again, um, for instance, in the proof of uh, Cohen lens heuristic over function fields by uh, Akshay and uh, Jordan and uh, Greg Wasserson, so there is a, a big uh, black box, which is uh, stability, which uh, guarantees a vanishing of a huge number of uh, cohomology groups. So, less fixed and going there. Mm. Yeah. much harder, and I think there's a problem with that group. Yes. So. Okay. So I guess right now we're at the point where we have questions for the audience rather than the speaker. Uh, so let's thank John again. <laughs>